just wanted to welcome you all and reiterate to put your introduction in the chat. Um, let us know where you're beaming in from. Uh, we have a busy program planned tonight. We have a guest speaker uh, who is going to talk about climate change in Illinois, uh, which is great because we get the world view and the US view, but this will bring it much closer. We're also going to have an update on what's happening with the governor's energy bill, formerly known as CJA. And we're going to have a, a report from some of the members who were on the front lines at line three in Minnesota last week. So first, I think we, we've got a couple of important announcements that we wanted to make. Pam, do you want to let people know what's happening with the, the virtual lobbying for our congressman? Right, OK. Uh, well, we've had um, an effort underway to find leaders for each of the districts where we're trying to lobby our congressional representatives. And that is all to organize for a virtual lobbying session the week of June 21st to 25th. We have most of the districts covered. I think we're still waiting on two or three of them to get people that are willing to organize, coordinate and organize the meetings. And we're now signing up team members by district who are willing to join in those meetings. Um, National Climate Reality has asked us to use the week of June 21 to 25 before Congress goes into recess for the 4th of July as the week where we make our initial mm -hmm. group meeting. So some, some people are having to put it off until after that. Um, I know because their congressman isn't available, but for those who are, we're trying to get as many meetings in during the week of the 21st to the 25th. So if you did not yet sign up for joining a team meeting in a particular district, and you're willing to take 30 minutes out of your schedule someday next week, It'll depend on the, the district and the congressman what day it is. But if you if you are willing to at least consider it, you could put the um, email information in the chat. Just tell me that you're interested and uh, what district you're in. If and if you don't know, if you don't know your congressman, um, then you we'll look it up for you if 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 you don't know it. But um, if you do know it, just put in your name, your name, email, and your congressman, and then uh, we'll match you up with the team meeting that is going to be happening hopefully next week. We have a couple already set and some others are in the works. And there will be talking points that are circulated before you have the actual meeting so you'll know um, what to say. In the end, it's really, they just wanna hear from you personally why you care about the American jobs plan that the president is negotiating right now and why you want them to get behind the bill and the climate provisions in the bill and make sure that those are not bargained away <laughs> in the compromise that will come out of the House and the Senate. So it's a, it, we're, we're getting a lot of volunteers um, we really need more though, uh, for, particularly for certain meetings. And, um, and so regardless of where you live, if you have an interest, just put your name and, and your district in the chat. If you don't know your district, let me know that and we'll look you up and we'll get you involved. Thank you, Pam. The other thing I wanted to make a pitch for the new app Climate Action Now that we, our chapter and a couple others are piloting for climate reality. Um, we, you can download it from the app store. It's free. 
and by sending messages to your representatives, by learning more about climate, by doing a number of things that are, are suggested on the app, um, you can earn trees, you can log acts of leadership, and more important, you can have an influence uh, on officials. So it's climate action now. If you go to our member drive, there's a search function, just search for climate action now and it will tell you how to get started uh, and how to work with it. We have a few people who are using it a lot. Um, Tom Sutter has earned 19 trees I'm way behind him with 10, but we've got uh, Peter Marinelli and, and Josh and Natalie and Farai and Jelena and a number of other people are using it, but we want to get mass coverage. We want to send lots of emails or phone calls on important issues, both nationally and locally. So that, those are the two announcements for right now. I want to introduce our, our guest speaker. We are really fortunate to have snagged Jim Angel, who is a former Illinois state climatologist, who was one of the authors of um, the Illinois climate assessment that was just released. He also wrote the Midwest section of the national climate assessment a couple of years ago. He has for many years been um, on the national, or I'm sorry, the Illinois Water Survey. 36 years, so he knows a lot about water and he's written a number of um, papers on e extreme rain events. Um, I think that he will have a lot to tell you that you can use if you're doing presentations, that you can use if you're talking to your representatives or even to your friends who don't think this is happening here now because it is. So Jim, do you want to come on and uh, you should be able to share your screen. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me, I'll start up the, the PowerPoint here and we'll see, see what we can see. Uh, All right. Here we go. Oh. Okay, there we go. Well, thank you for that introduction there. Um, this is good timing for us because we've just completed the, the, the uh, climate assessment for Illinois. And this is done in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy, which you probably are familiar with. Uh, they're the ones that we originally did the, the assessment for, but it's obviously uh, um, useful for everybody. And uh, so we had support from, a little bit of support from them with their staff, uh, but it was primarily uh, a university driven uh, exercise. Uh, Don Wobbles at the University of Illinois along with myself were the co-leads from uh, the university side. And then we had uh, Karen Peterson and Maria Lemke from the Nature Conservancy uh, also kind of oversee the, the chapters. But we had about, oh, about 40 authors uh, with expertise uh, in Illinois on various matters. And we'll talk about the, the specifics here in a minute. But I think just kind of the quick overview is this, uh, this is the national, or, uh, an assessment of what we stand, understand in terms of observed climate change and also projected future climate change. So we've got two parts to that and then what the impacts uh, are or likely to be from those changes. 
And so it really kind of is the, as one of my old bosses used to say, the state of the science of, of what we know about climate change in Illinois. And there's, uh, uh, you know, there have been the international studies that have been done and then the, the national assessment that I worked on as well and Don Wubbles worked on as well. And then, so this is zooming in on Illinois. And the hope is that this gives more relevant information for that you can act on locally. So when you talk about, you know, global warming, it's, you know, that's one picture, but being very specific about Illinois, hopefully will be uh, helping in your messaging moving forward. And I will say just kind of on side before I forget it is that uh, these aren't state secrets. So I'm very happy to share these slides or other slides I might have if you have specific questions about uh, climate change in Illinois. So uh, hopefully that can, can help you when, when you talk to your representatives and so forth. So let's see, oops, I went too far. So for the introduction, uh, this is uh, the, the, we have, uh, all this is online and I'll show you the URL at the end. But basically we divided it into seven chapters in Illinois and then we chose topics that we thought touched on the lives and well being of all the citizens of the state. And so we have, uh, we talk about the observed and projected climate change. We also talk about the impacts of climate change on water resources and agriculture, naturally, uh, as well as health and ecosystems. And also talk a little bit about knowledge and research priorities moving forward. So, it's very much on the sciencey side of, of things, as opposed to outreach and uh, and and programs that is for, for mitigation and adaptation. So it kind of gives you a lot of background information on, on where we stand on the climate science part of it. And so, kind of the, the overarching theme is that the the climate of Illinois is changing and it's changing very rapidly. Uh, and that it's human activities that are the dominant cause of the climate change in Illinois since at least the middle part of the, the 20th century. In Illinois, climate is expected to continue changing over this century with significant impacts on the urban and rural communities and sectors throughout the state. I think we'll show that some of these changes are going to be pretty dramatic. Um, so, we did break down the state into three parts. I won't talk too much about the three parts tonight since you guys are mostly interested in, in uh, the northeastern part of the state, but uh, there's a lot of information that you kind of get a different experience depending on where you are in the state. So Southern Illinois, obviously much warmer there already and the heat warming in the future is expected to be even more pronounced down there. So but everybody gets to uh, experience the climate change uh, in this report. So we use some projections of future climate change. You know, that's actually one of the hardest parts is trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future. We have observations. We have pretty solid knowledge of what's happened so far, but it's the future that's actually highly uncertain. Even if we had a perfect climate model, we still don't know what the global carbon emissions are going to be like in mid to late century. So we use some scenarios. So we have a higher scenario, which is in the lingo of the RCP 8.5 and uh, and then the uh, and then we used a, a lower one which is the, the RCP 4.5 and these were used in a lot of uh, national assessments in the last national assessment and some other studies and kind of just benchmarks of, of how you would relate to it so the, the higher scenario that's where you just keep on doing what you're doing now and you inject more carbon into the atmosphere at the current rates that we're going at, and we're doing a pretty good job of that. Uh, the lower scenario is where you start to taper off and actually the, the, it really start to taper off by mid to late century. And we'll see in a minute that that makes a huge difference in the climate response. So the higher emission is continue business as usual. The lower scenario is, is doing a lot of good things in terms of reducing emissions moving forward, and it makes a huge difference. And, and on the right-hand side here is what it does to global temperatures, kind of give you a hint. So it's about four degrees Celsius, which would be about eight or nine degrees uh, Fahrenheit for the high scenario by the end of the century, and a more moderate, uh, just under two degrees uh, Celsius 
by the end of the century under the lower scenario. So for Illinois, if you look at observed changes, we've got a table on the left here that looks at overnight temperatures and daytime temperatures and the averages, and it's plus signs all across the, the board there, except for the daytime highs in the summertime. So every part of, regardless of the season and whether you're talking about daytime or nighttime temperatures, we have been warming already over the last century. So this is looking at the early 20th century versus the early 21st century that we're in right now. In fact, some of the strongest warming has actually been in the wintertime. The least amount of warming has been in the summertime, especially daytime high temperatures. And I'll get back to that in a second here after I show you the precipitation side of that. So it's temperatures, widespread warming across the state. Nobody is got left out on that kind of warming. If we look at the observed precipitation changes, those have also been pretty strong across all four season, eight and a half to almost 16% increase in precipitation uh, over the last century. So widespread wetter conditions already and widespread warming already. One exception is that summertime temperatures, daytime temperatures. And we think what's happening is that because it's been so darn wet, especially in the spring and early summer, in many cases, that tends to hold down our daytime high temperatures. It's pretty hard to get in the upper 90s to low 100s until you really dry out that soil. In fact, this year is a very good example of that work. Right now, we got in your part of the state, we have very dry soils, and that's causing the temperatures to skyrocket. So those, in the summertime, the, actually the temperature and precipitation kind of work hand in hand together. Uh, you get hot, dry conditions can really uh, take off, uh, but if it's been very wet, it tends to hold down the daytime temperatures. Bad news is it means also the humidity levels also climb during those wetter conditions. So that kind of gives you an overall picture of the, the general trends in temperature and precipitation. Probably not a big surprise if you talk to user groups around the state, especially the precipitation side, that's been a, a big headache. Uh, both from things like agriculture and stormwater drainage and things like that. Now, if you look at projected temperature changes, this is the top panel is uh, the, the lower scenario for mid to late century, and the bottom panel is the higher scenario for mid to late century. And there's in the report, there's a whole series of these. And I'm just showing you kind of a, a snapshot of some of these uh, that we that we have in there. So if you look at the top panel versus the lower panel, they're almost always the case that you see much dr more dramatic changes under the higher emission scenarios under both the mid to late century. And you see the strongest response to climate change in the late century high emission scenario. So if you wanna talk about how bad things can get, that's where you wanna look is that late century high emission scenario where we're running about eight to nine degrees warming by the end of the century in degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, whereas if we could pull it back to lower emission levels, you're still dealing with a four to five degree warming by late century, but I'll take that over eight to nine degrees warming. So it, it makes a big difference uh, depending on what emission path we follow. Also in general, the, the impacts are gonna be stronger late century than they are mid century. Although I think most of us in this audience, you know, our lifetime experience is gonna be more in that, that mid-century picture at this point. So much stronger warming uh, moving forward than what we saw in the past. So in the past we've warmed, depending on the season and so forth, about uh, one and a half, two degrees warming Fahrenheit. This will be much more rapid warming uh, moving on into the future. And by the way, you know, sometimes it's hard to put this into context of what four to five degree warming sounds like, uh, but our, our, uh, some of our hottest summers ever were in 1936. So that summer of 1936, scorching hot, that was about four to five degrees warmer than, than the modern day average. So it's even that four to five degree warming is gonna be a significantly warmer period than what, we, what we're in right now. If we look at, projected uh, precipitation changes. 
this one isn't quite as, as dramatic. Uh, we are going to expect you to see increases in precipitation moving forward. Uh, by in the lower scenario on the top row there, it's about uh, anywhere from uh, zero to about 6%. Although I would say some of the stronger indications, stronger wet trends are in the northern part of the state. And by uh, under the higher scenario, it's a little stronger, three to 10%, depending on where you are uh, moving forward. So compared to the observed changes of 10 to 15%, it's kind of in that same ballpark moving forward, uh, which is problematic, but I would say it's probably not, not as problematic as the temperature changes. But probably the bigger thing, this is the thing that I've worked on a lot over the last three, six years is the heavy precipitation events. And those have become more frequent over time. So on the left-hand side here, we've got a graph of the number of two inch rain events. And that's about the threshold of where you start to see flooding issues, uh, both in rural and urban areas. And that is, while well, there's a lot of year to year variability with that black line, and when you have five year averages of those green bars, you can see a pretty steady upward march. And the most recent period, 2015 to 2019 on there is head and shoulders above everybody else. So we've almost doubled the the frequency of, of, uh, of these heavier rain events. And that's projected to continue on into the future. Uh, even under the low scenario, it's, you know, we're looking at uh, anywhere from, in many cases, uh, up to 60%, and then up in, in the higher scenario, up to maybe 90% increase in the number of days of two inch rain events. So that's something that we're gonna, we've got, already have problems with that. And that's going to continue on into the future uh, as we move forward. So that's something we need to plan for, uh, regardless of the emission scenario that we're going to have to deal with. Uh, also, some other things to look at is the, and I, this is one of my personal thresholds of, of discomfort on heat is the 100 degree Fahrenheit. That's where I'd say it's really, really hot outside. You know, that's pretty rare for us in Illinois. We, especially in the northern part of the state, it's, 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 it's pretty rare to see 100 degree temperatures outside. Uh, by mid-century, it could be uh, a little more common, especially under the high emission scenario. But if you really want to get scared, look at that last uh, map there of the high scenario, late century, where we have, uh, basically over a month of 100 degree temperatures. That's the kind of stuff that you'd see maybe in Las Vegas, kind of, that's, that, that's the kind of the heat that you would see out there. Uh, or like they're already seen in, in Phoenix, Arizona. So those are, so it's a totally different ball game. So, you know, earlier we were talking about, well, you know, four to five degree warming by late century into the lower scenario and, and eight to nine into the high scenario. That's what it translates into. It's a much more uh, 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 frequency of these uh, extreme temperatures. I guess on the flip side, if, you're, if you hate winter in Illinois, it's going to be much milder moving forward too. So we're, we're skimming off the, the really cold days and adding in the really hot days. Uh, this nighttime temperatures of 70 degrees or more, this doesn't get quite as much uh, attention, but it's actually very important uh, for agriculture. Uh, nighttime temperatures above 70, and you start to have trouble with heat stress in animals, as well as crops. Crop yields start to drop uh, with nighttime temperatures as the plants recover from the daytime heat. Uh, it's also stressful for humans because it's harder, especially if you don't have air conditioning, it's hard to recover at night when you have the higher nighttime temperatures. And the frequency of those events is also going to skyrocket on into the future. And the same story uh, to a lesser extent with days where the nighttime temperatures never drop below 80 degrees. And that's when you start to see a lot of heat stress and heat related deaths. Uh, so it's not just the daytime temperatures that are problematic, it's those nighttime temperatures as well. Uh, so other things, uh, the growing yeah. season is expected to become longer uh, by about 10 to 15 days or even 21 days by late century under the, the lower scenario and even longer 
uh, under the high scenario, about even up to 45 days under the high scenario. This is kind of one of those things where it's it's kind of a 50-50 split. Good news is that means a longer growing season for crops. The bad news is it's a longer growing season for pests and, and uh, uh, both insect pest and, and weed pest as well. So uh, it, and also things like pollen uh, season will be longer as well. So this is one of those that there are winners and losers in this. Uh, so that one is it remains to be seen how that will play out, but it, uh, it, it definitely will be a change in how we do things in Illinois. Jim, can I just make a comment about that last slide? Sure. So on, on those nights over 70 degrees, you got to remember that those are all going to be in the three uh, hottest months of the summer, June, July, and August. And so when you're talking, you know, 60 to 70 day, nights over 70 degrees, that's almost uh, two thirds of the nights during those hot months. You know, that's right. you're not gonna yeah. have that. That's really hot all the time. Yeah, that's unrelenting heat there uh, moving forward. Very and scary. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's that's really scary. In fact, I'd say, of, of the, you know, kind of going off the side here, but I'd say of, of this for this report, I'd say probably the, the thing that scares me the most is the, the heat issue uh, moving forward because it is so dramatic and it's the one where it's not just uncomfortable, it's, it's actually an in, um, increase in heat mortality. So there's uh, the life that will be impacted by it is, is very significant. So we'll kind of skip through, well, we'll kind of go through some of the, the impacts on some of the resources in Illinois, just kind of give you a quick flavor. And the report goes into a lot more detail. So we're just kind of uh, getting a, an appetizer of, of some of these, I would say. Uh, so the impacts on water resources, uh, we've seen a lot of issues with flooding already in, in Illinois. Uh, flooding not only causes physical damage, but also affects water quality in both urban and rural areas. It's especially problematic uh, during these flood events where you have uh, uh, runoff from fields, you get uh, flooding in, in rural er or urban areas and that uh, flooding, even the flooding of basements and things like that can, that can lead to all kinds of public health hazards. And that's something that we've been wrestling with. In fact, we did a a study a couple of years ago at the water survey looking at urban uh, flooding that's outside of the river systems, but actually just basement flooding and things like that. And there was about, I think it was about $2.3 billion in losses over a 10 year period of that was insured losses. So there's uninsured, there's the, the numbers are probably even much higher than that. Uh, so it's a very significant uh, problem for Illinois already. And with the increase uh, in the general precipitation and the expectation of the increase in the heavy precipitation events, that that's going to be a real uh, nightmare moving forward. So that that's a, that's a very much a concern. We're already wrestling with issues of the heavy precipitation, flushing out the nutrients out of the fields and dumping that into the rivers. Uh, one of the things that we've seen a lot of now is heavy rain events during the winter months. You know, it used to be we'd just get snow in the winter. Now we're seeing uh, storms come through that dump large amounts of <clears throat> large areas of, of two to four inches of precipitation over bare ground that they get soil erosion on bare fields. And then you also get the nutrient losses as well, ends up down the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> so this is an area that, that myself and Mamchella Marcus have worked a lot in were increase in the heavy precipitation here Chicago at Midway and Marengo. So this is just the each year the heaviest rain event for that year, uh, the one day maximum here. And so you can see there's a trend, uh, an increased trend in that plus there's some real spikes there that uh, that show up as well. And we got labeled here are the the studies that calculate the rainfall frequency numbers that are used in design structures. Uh, so all the way back to TP40, which came out in 1961. And then the two uh, bulletins from the water survey and a NOAA atlas there. So we just came out with bulletin 75, 
which is the latest update to those numbers on rainfall frequencies of the 100 year storm. Uh, but that's all based on the observed data so far. What we really need is projections out in the future so we can say, okay, well, we need to build this water handling structure to deal with the 100 year storm as it occurs in 2050 or 2075 uh, for those long uh, lived uh, structures. So uh, that's an area that we're working on right now of how to make those projections and how to make those design decisions. So that's, uh, that's a real challenge uh, moving forward. Uh, and then also, as we mentioned earlier, the increase in, in river flooding as well, and that, that shows up uh, across Illinois, a uh, pretty, pretty strong uh, pattern there. Uh, and that's uh, issues not only with uh, the flooding aspects of it, but also disruption of transportation. So we have a lot of barge traffic go up and down the Illinois River, especially. And, and so that gets disrupted under these uh, heavy, these uh, large flooding events. That was especially true in 2019, where we had basically the, the Illinois and the Mississippi River systems uh, above St. Louis shut down for, I think, almost about three or four months there. So very disruptive. The other thing is that, uh, that we're working on at the water survey is looking at the floodplains and, and projecting uh, uh, the impacts of climate change on those. And this is just an example of two different floodplains uh, in the Chicago area that uh, have very different responses to the extreme event. So if you've got a very narrow channel with steep sides there, uh, and it'd be very well contained, then, uh, then the, the differences at mid to late century aren't that bad. But if you've got a lot, like a lot of Illinois, you got the, all these wide flat areas uh, that you can have uh, any kind of big rain event, it spills over to, into a much larger area. So many communities are gonna be uh, wrestling with uh, rainfall values that will cause flooding over much wider areas than what we traditionally think of as the 100 year floodplain. So impacts on agriculture. Uh, this is another chapter that obviously uh, of great interest for everybody in Illinois. Uh, corn and soybean yields in the upper left-hand corner have been increasing over time. Uh, so, you know, there might be kind of a maybe false sense of security that, oh, yeah, we've, we've got uh, a handle on, on weather and climate and, and yields. Uh, but there have been impacts that we, we do see, see things like the 2012 drought caused uh, big drops in yield. So uh, even with the advanced hybrids and, and plant genetics and, and, and cultural practices, uh, we still are sensitive to weather and climate uh, episodes, and that is expected to continue on into the future. Uh, so we can see that uh, if we get, uh, especially with the problems, kind of the dual problems of, of more heavy rain events and the severe heat, especially uh, that can lead to uh, uh, greatly reduced yields by mid to late century. Uh, corn and soybeans are both have limits on, just like humans, uh, on how much heat they can actually take. Uh, before they start to shut down and, and, and the productivity not only drops off, but sometimes just goes to zero. Uh, we have some, there has uh, been some research done, at, a lot of research done at the university about looking at the benefits of CO2 fertilization. So some plants, basically the broadleaf plants like more CO2, corn not so much. They don't really, the grass type plants don't really respond to that. And you tell I'm not a biologist when I say, <laughs> I'm using descriptive terms here, uh, non-technical terms. Uh, but by uh, mid to century or so, that heat drought combination uh, could have even substantial impacts on soybeans. I would say soybeans maybe look to be a little tougher than corn at this point, uh, but even they, they have their limits on uh, moving forward. So, some of this may be solved by improved genetics. It's always a possibility, but th those come at a cost. The, the expense of the, the seed has climbed over the years. As the yields increase, so is the cost of the seed. And so it may be able to maintain yields, but at much higher cost moving forward. We also have expectation of uh, increase in weeds, pest, and disease. 
uh, due to the warmer winters, especially, and the increased uh, spring rainfall and the higher temperatures. You know, paradoxically, our cold winters has kind of helped us out a lot agriculturally because it kills off a lot of the insects so they don't enter overwinter. Uh, but as our winters get milder, they're going to be able to overwinter and, and, and have at it with the, the crops even earlier. Uh, obviously, livestock are very sensitive to heat stress. They are expected to see about 40 to 55 day increase in the number of days over 86 degrees per year. That's kind of one of the thresholds of where you start to see lost productivity, you know, milk production and, and uh, weight gain and things like that. Uh, also, uh, reduced forage quality. So things like alfalfa, if it gets too hot or too wet or some and those kind of things, it also reduce the the quality of that as well. And also with specialty crops, so fruits and vegetables are sensitive to that. Uh, and and uh, as well as the fact that with extreme heat, it's likely to impact farm labor, which is especially critical for specialty crops in Illinois. Now, Illinois is the number one in terms of uh, uh, pumpkin production for can for eating. You know, everybody's got decorative pumpkins, but uh, there's an area around Morton, Illinois, that is uh, that produces about 90% of all the, the canned pumpkin that we use for pumpkin pie in, across the United States. So there's expected to be big increase impacts uh, on, on uh, specialty crops as well. And I would also say that uh, there's many concerns about the impacts to uh, public health moving forward. Obviously, when you're talking about heavy rain events and heat waves and things like that, that we're going to see lots of uh, impacts there. And so we have a whole chapter uh, devoted to the health impacts. I think this is a, a really important aspect that, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of focus on the, the flooding and the and the, the crop losses and things like that. But really the health impacts are what impact all of us uh, in a very immediate way. So. We have the heat stress, we got the floods, the droughts, and the worsening air quality as the environmental changes, but then that impacts us through uh, things like the tick and mosquito disease. Uh, you get respiratory problems with mold, you get heat, wet, a heat stroke, and, and, and contaminated drink, drinking water from flooding. Also have mental health issues and worsening allergies and asthma, and the list goes on as we move forward. So there's uh, big impacts on us on everything we do. And this middle map here is the uh, age-adjusted hospitalization rate for for uh, for heat-related injuries. And you see Chicago and the surrounding area. That's the bullseye there. But we also have some other parts of the state that are also sensitive to heat uh, injuries, uh, and it's because of farm workers and and also many areas don't have access to good health care. So there, we have many vulnerable populations in Chicago and elsewhere. And in fact, with the 95 heat wave, we, we know that the hardest hit communities were uh, communities uh, with the low income and communities of color. So it was uh, especially hard hit in those areas. And that's expected that, uh, we kind of hinted at earlier with the growing season that Things like the pollen season expected to increase uh, as we move on into the future. And so those are, are have health impacts as well. So I can personally relate to the pollen season. I was uh, sneezing all day yesterday. And I also have, uh, you know, we touched on this earlier about the medical and physical health, but also the mental health. And also the community health is impacted by climate change as well. And these are kind of emerging uh, areas of research. We, I mean, we've always known that that's been the case, but I think there's been more attention being turned towards the mental issues uh, from these. And I can say from firsthand and secondhand experience that uh, you get to talk to people who have been in droughts or floods uh, and, and heat waves there's a lot of stress and anxiety and depression and, and, and substance abuse and alcoholism. I mean, the, the whole gamut of, of uh, uh, health impacts uh, uh, rise up during that. And so I think that's an area of, it's gonna be a, a, a greater focus moving forward. So I, I look forward to 
uh, more attention paid to that area because I think it's a very important area that we need to consider with climate change. Impact on ecosystems in Illinois. Uh, so we had a whole group that, that worked on this and, and uh, the, the things that they, they found in, in Illinois is that uh, obviously the natural ecosystems in the state are much reduced in area and also they're isolated. So that makes them hard for them to respond to climate change. But also the climate change we're seeing is, is much more rapid than in the past. Uh, so it's going to be a good struggle for our native species uh, with some actually uh, maybe doing a little better because they like the warmer weather and the wetter conditions, but others may be less suitable. So things like sweet gum and post oak and hackberry may actually improve a little bit and then others uh, like the aspen and the Ohio buckeye uh, may, may actually decline there. So there's uh, concerns about that with the, the nature of what the natural systems moving forward. And also that with climate change, we're likely to see the, uh, the introduction of more undesirable species into the state. Uh, there's a number of them here, the emerald ash borer and the, the honeysuckle, we'll see a lot of that around. And the Johnson grass and the bittersweet and those things. So we're getting more invasive species coming into the state and, uh, and then, and then the, the aquatic species are especially sensitive because we're, we're changing things like the ice cover and, and the flooding frequency and, and things like that and the water temperatures moving forward. So that could be in, big impacts there as well. And just kind of on a, a, a side note, uh, I was visiting with uh, my sister-in-law a week ago and uh, she lives in Hannibal, Missouri which is about, uh, if you drew the line straight across, it'd be right here in Champaign. Uh, and in the middle of the street, unfortunately, was uh, some roadkill and it was an armadillo. Uh, you know, I lived for a long, long time in Illinois and Missouri and I, I've never seen an armadillo until about five years ago. And now you, it is fairly common to see that on the side of the road in central and southern Illinois, especially. Uh, and so that's, you know, something we may have to think about in, by mid-century, that may be, maybe that'll be the new state animal, maybe it'll be the Chicago armadillos instead of the Chicago bears or something. Uh, so that's, you know, we're going to see a lot of changes uh, uh, moving forward. And then the other thing is about, for Illinois, is that a lot of our land management is, is actually in the private sector. And so that's uh, a little different. You know, in the Western states, it's a lot of it's federally managed in one form or another. So you can have a lot of mandates come down from on top. But here we have to do a lot more higher level of cooperation and outreach with private landowners to uh, try to uh, re at least repair it and at least hold the line on, on some of the things that are happening to the ecosystems. So that's it uh, as, as far as the, the kind of give you a flavor of the full report. And here's the link to that. You can also go to the Nature Conservancy site for Illinois. And I think they've got it in, in one of their sections there about climate change in Illinois. So there's uh, the full report. There's also uh, at the beginning of an executive summary, it's a little shorter. And uh, I think there might be, actually, I'll have to look and see, there might've been a presentation, recorded presentation as well floating around out there. But this will get you to the actual report. This is the permanent uh, uh, link to that uh, report. And so I think we got some time for questions. Is that right, Cynthia? Yeah, we do. Um, there, there was one in the chat from Aman Gupta. Will the mortality rate increase or decrease as the number of extreme cold days will reduce, but then there'll be more extreme hot days. That's right. So yeah, that's right. You'll be taking the, the, the cold related deaths uh, off the table or reduce those. And not only is it from hypothermia, but also, you know, winter weather in general, uh, you know, driving in the snow and so forth can lead to fatalities and injuries too. So the expectation is that is to be reduced. Uh, to be replaced by the, the higher uh, mortality of the, uh, 
from the heat related deaths. And, and again, it kind of depends on how this plays out. If it, under the low scenario, uh, it won't be quite as, as, as traumatic, but it'll still be uh, significant uh, even under that low scenario. So I, you know, I, offhand, I, uh, I don't know what the numbers are to, to tell you that, oh, the, you know, who's going to win out, but I, I'm pretty sure that the numbers I've seen uh, in the past have shown that the, the, the number of heat related deaths is going to go up quite a bit. Okay, uh, we have a question from Jane Goldenberg. It, it's kind of long. Uh, Jane, you want to ask it? Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, I so my question is to, well, it's sort of two parts, but they really both both relates to drought. So how does this year's drought fit in with these long-term trends? Because I read somewhere that this is the driest spring we've had since 1934. The um, other thing is is that since we've had these changes. I'm wondering how farmers are beginning to adapt to the change of precipitation. So we have all these heavy rains, but then we have a lot of dry time where there is no rain, things dry up, um, that requires change, changes in, in the way they, you know, irrigate or whatever. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we talked about this in the report, but I didn't mention it here tonight, was the long-term drought picture. <clears throat> if you look at Illinois, historically, we've had a lot of, very significant, very long-term droughts, uh, especially in the 1930s and 1950s. And those were, some of those were actually multi-year droughts and they were pretty substantial. Uh, those kind of droughts have gone away in the last uh, 50 years or 60 years. And they have been replaced by these shorter, very intense droughts. So I look at 1988 and 2012 and this year, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're, they, they're at least the 1980, 2012 droughts, while significant, were actually relatively short lived. They basically started up in the spring, developed and got fully developed in early summer. And by late summer, they had started to fade away. And we started to see some relief from, from them by August. So uh, that's a different kind of, of drought than the, what we've experienced in the past. Are, 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 so those are the kind of, moving forward, that's the kind we're expected to see are these, uh, these shorter term, in fact, there's actually a term where a specific case where you have hot dry weather combined that really dries out very fast. And those are flash droughts. And what we've got this year is, is kind of qualifying for that since we've got a combo of, of the really hot weather combined with the, the dry conditions. Uh, so that, and, and, and the comment about uh, the farmers and how they're reacting to this is that, you know, one, one way they can combat it is with, in the field, they can put in more tile drainage to drain off the excess water in the spring. Uh, historically, they just, they just put pipes in the ground and just let the water flow. Now they're trying to uh, manage that a little better so that they don't drain all the water off. They may want to retain some of that. They also want to retain the nutrients that, that may have been that ending up in the, the, the rivers uh, from that tile drainage. So sometimes that can be equals. But that is one response. And then uh, we have seen an increased interest in irrigation in the last uh, 10 years or so, especially after the 2012 drought. I think that uh, many farmers uh, start to think about irrigation, especially if you're in an area that has easy access to groundwater or surface water. Well, first, Jim, I'd like to say thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation and absolute fabulous data that you've obviously been collecting for quite some time. Um, so I'm curious, you know, one of the trends on stormwater management has to put in retention with urban construction activities. You see stormwater retention ponds all the place and now they're putting uh, 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 concrete uh, um, units underground to, to hold water. I'm wondering if in, in, in that uh, data that's been gathered on precipitation and flooding in the states has shown some improvements in that uh, flooding as a result of uh, stormwater practices that have been implemented in urban areas over the last few decades. Yeah, I think there are some success stories on that. Uh, uh, you know, they're everything from the, the, the big tunnel that they've got in Chicago and then 
uh, within the city of Chicago there. And then uh, some of these other projects, I think that certainly has helped to moderate some of the, the impacts. I know here in Champaign, we've, they've uh, embarked on several uh, projects to improve the, the stormwater management and, and it's, it's really helped. So I think now that being said, uh, what I, we have been seeing is that that has been very successful in areas in cities and communities that are well funded. Uh, what we're really struggling is with the older communities that aren't as well off financially that, uh, uh, you know, they're kind of stuck with uh, the aging infrastructure and, and inability to, to do some of these projects. So and that's where we're seeing some of the biggest impacts are in some of those communities. So it does vary quite a bit from community to community. Thank you. Oh, and I put a link to the to the the news release on there, which I think has the link to the full report. But I'll also uh, check on that other. I'll, I'll get you some other links too that go directly to it. Okay. And did you say that we could have your slides? Yes. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, so I'll share those with you, and then you can share them with everybody else. Uh, or we'll figure out how to, to make those public. And Jim, do you make any recommendations at the end about how to about the the major things you think would um, help us reach the lower scenario instead of the higher? No, oh, yeah. You know, we re that part we really didn't get into because that was uh, kind of a different area. Uh, and so I think um, there, maybe that's a thing for future conversations uh, with uh, the Nature Conservancy and other groups is, is how to um, make those kind of reductions. And I will say that there seems to be a lot of movement right now at both the national level and the state level uh, that uh, that wasn't happening uh, even a year ago. So uh, I'm a little more optimistic now than I was. Uh, and then, and then you know, I was just listening to the news where I think it was Ford or GM was saying, well, they're, they're going to make all switch to all electric car vehicles by 2035. And, you know, so there's a, a lot of things going on there now that uh, weren't happening in a while. Okay, Jim, can I ask you a question about agriculture again? Some of us are doing regenerative agriculture, working in a group. And um, have you, how much have you come across the ideas of no-till and cover crops helping to reduce the, the effects of drought? Yes, yeah, so we talk a little bit about that in the report about how those uh, uh, cover crops and no-till can uh, uh, help with <laughs> soil management, soil health, uh, and, and also in terms of uh, returning carbon back into the soil. Uh, now, it may not be, that's not gonna be something that'll uh, be uh, the final solution for uh, how to, to reduce the CO2 levels, but it is a, a one way of, of uh, helping to reduce the carbon emissions is to sequester some of that carbon back into the soil. It's kind of tricky. You have to do it the right way or else you, you lose that benefit, but uh, so yeah, there's, uh, we did talk about that some, uh, and I think that Nature Conservancy has some uh, programs that are actually, you know, doing field work where they're showing that kind of stuff. So uh, I think that's another area that we might see more of moving forward is, is uh, carbon credits for farmers and, you know, paying them to do the, the, the kinds of things that need to be done. So. Okay, I think we're going to have to wind up this section, though Madeline discovered that if you put the D before the B, okay. <laughs> there you go. then it works. Just it there. <laughs> so so you, the URL, we've got a couple, couple ways to go. But yeah. um, thank you so much. I mean, sure. that, that was powerful. Great. I. I did, I had downloaded the report. Uh, it's fairly easy to do and people may want to spend some more time pouring over it and, but you've really summarized it beautifully for us that uh, 
the problems are heat and wet. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> and right. They're, and they're pretty bad. Yeah. So, um, thank you a million for for coming, and I'll sure. I'll be in touch with you afterwards. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Cool.